you're one of the most famous people in the world, but of course it didn't start like that. So you came to prominence with your one woman versatile show called The Spook Show, um, right. and then it went on to Broadway. So how did you even get started doing The Spook Show? Well, I started writing about uh, a lot of my experiences in Europe because I'd gone to Europe for the first time. And I want to say it was to, in part, to go to the festival, but I, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But I wrote about the things that I saw that I just felt if I stood there and talked about them, they would not be as interesting. And that if I put my adventures in the mouths of different mm -hmm. people, uh, people might pay more attention to them because it wasn't uh, me saying, oh, and I went to, you know, uh, Amsterdam and I went to uh, the uh, places where I could get stoned. I felt like I needed to put it in the mouth of someone mm -hmm. who people would laugh and have some fun with. So I put it in the mouth of a junkie mm -hmm. named Fun King. Yes. And he talked about, you know, being on the plane and all of the hell that <laughs> aero flight is. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, we started talking about uh, more serious things, talking mm -hmm. uh, about seeing uh, the Oscar of, what is it, Shelley Winters, mm -hmm. whose Oscar is sitting in the Anne Frank house. Mm -hmm. And I talked about the way that being there made Fontaine feel, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and he invites the audience to try to be silent for a minute and then goes on to explain that this is what people had to do day after day after day, just trying to survive. Mm. But then I'm like cussing people out because, you know, they can't do it either. You know? <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a nice, it's a fun ride of six or seven characters and people seem to like them. And uh, from there, it uh, got me to uh, LA really to start talking to Steven Spielberg, who then invited me to do The Color Purple. And I was like, oh, okay, are you sure? Because I don't know anything about making movies. And he said, well, you'll be fine. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and it turned out he was right. I was okay. You were more than okay, Whoopi. You, I mean, no. you got an Oscar nomination. No, no, I mean, just in my soul. Yes. That I was okay, that I would be all right doing this. Because I, I, I know my way around the stage. Mm. I didn't really understand how you take two months to make a movie when we could just do it on a stage in two hours. He was like, well, it's a little more <laughs> complicated than that. And so I learned a lot with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was it was kind of a great way to enter into the world to first have Mike Nichols mm. holding one hand and Steven Spielberg holding the other, sort of bringing me into this new world of show business. And it, it's, it, it's been crazy, but really good, you know. And actually talking about Mike Nichols, um, obviously he's a theater, he was a theater director and it's my understanding that when he came to see you backstage at your spook show, he was in floods yeah. of tears. Yes, uh, Mike and his mother were on the last ship out of Germany. Wow. Yeah, they were on the last ship. And so when he saw me talking about Anne Frank, mm. it got to him and he came back to tell me this and he was in tears. He said he, he was sitting there just, you know, trying to hold everything back. And that was, you know, coming from a man who, who made the graduate, you know, who, who made, uh, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? This icon, I mean, the icon, that's a really big icon. And uh, he said, you move me to tears. I need to talk to you. Wow. And I was like, oh, okay. And so we didn't connect for a while. And I went back to Berkeley where I was living and my phone rang. <laughs> and I picked up and said, hello. He said, this is Mr. Nichols. And I said, oh, hey, how you doing? What are you up to? He said, well, do you remember? I said, I want to talk to you. And I said, yeah. He said, would you be interested in doing your show on Broadway? And I said, well, I don't know. I'm not <laughs> sure. 
And it was really for me the same thing as making movies. You know, I know how to perform in warehouse spaces, little tiny spaces, but this was something vastly different. And so between Mike, whose work I, I am and have always been a huge fan of, uh, both on stage and in film, and then Steven, it was like, well, okay, if you guys are, I don't know, maybe you're going to change your mind. <laughs> no, no, we're not going to change your mind. And they didn't. And so I got to be on Broadway for a nice long time and feed into Stephen, who said, listen, you'll figure this out. It'll be okay. I was like, okay. <laughs> but I was scared. Well, and it's been more than okay. And actually talking about Spielberg, there's no way we can talk about him without mentioning Blee T, Black E.T. <laughs> yes, so Blee T yes. cropped up in your audition for Spielberg. Well, well he, I, I did everything that I, I knew I was going to do. And my new managers and new agents said to me, you know, you can do everything in your cadre, but you cannot do Blee T. And I was like, but, but, and they were like, no, no, no. <laughs> E.T. is, you know, that's his baby. He created it. It's, you know, it's called Amblin Studios. Don't do Bleed Tea. And I said, okay, I won't, do, I won't do it. And suddenly, at the end of my show, they were yelling more. And I said, well, I have one more thing, but I've been asked not to do it. <laughs> and Steven said, what is it? I said, well, I don't know if I should tell you this. He said, tell me. And so I did. And he said, well, I, wouldn't, I, I would like to see it. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, what, uh, okay. This is like, I've blown everything now, I have to do it. So I did it mm -hmm. for him. It basically was my version of E.T. where he lands in the project. Ah, brilliant. And he gets in with four little kids who, who then introduce him to a pimp and he can't make a <laughs> phone call because the phones don't work. Uh, and he then becomes a pimp himself and, and he's got his guns and his thing. And it, it's a very stereotypical visual. Mm. When his people come back to get him, he takes an a AK-47 and blows them away. The reason this story comes about is because I would listen to people talk to new Americans and say, you have to assimilate. Mm. Blee T, the, the point was, if he had assimilated, he maybe would not have shot <laughs> all of his, you know, fellow ETs, mm. you know, but because he had assimilated, he became someone totally different. So it's all about not totally assimilating mm. so that you don't lose part of yourself. Incredible. And I did it and it was quiet when I was done. I mean, like, quiet. <laughs> it's like, oh, I messed this up. And I'm just like, okay, I should have just listened to everybody. And then I heard applause. Wow. And he said, I never thought of it that way. I never thought of it that way. And what a great way for you to take it and evolve him to tell yet another part of the human story. So I was like, really, really? Okay, cool, <laughs> you know? I just, you know, just that's how my head worked mm. in terms of, you know, what we call alien, mm. you know? So why not take the alien everybody knows yeah. and give him another, you know, another layer? So it worked very well for me and it, uh, it helped get me my job in Color Purple. 